This weekend, uh, as Memorial Day uh, is coming tomorrow, it, it's a day of remembering. And one of the things that I've been doing for the last couple weeks, kind of looking towards this Sunday, since we didn't have a series, is I was just remembering the journey that we've been on as a church. This October, it'll be seven years since I became the pastor of this church. And it's been an incredible journey. It's been an amazing kind of adventure, what God has done over the last seven years here. And I firmly believe with all my heart that churches are not supposed to exist so that we have something to do on the weekend. Churches are not supposed to exist so that we can pay our religious dues. Churches are not supposed to exist so that we can check it off the list so that I feel better about myself. If you know me, then you know I'm not the type of pastor who's going to pat you on the back for showing up. Because I believe church is much bigger than you just attending something once a week. I, I feel like we are the church. And we are here to make a difference with our life. We are here to make a difference as a church, to be on point, to be on mission. The Great Commission, as the Bible calls it. And here's the thing. When you're passionate about His commission, God gets very passionate about your church. And so let me say, without it becoming any type of carnal pride, because we know it's, it's not about us, I do as your pastor want you to take pride in what God has done through our church, because it is truly remarkable what God has done over the last seven years. And God, of course, gets all the glory. We know that. We don't ever want to touch God's glory. We know it's him. But here's the thing. God uses people, and God needs people to follow his instructions. And God wants us to make a difference. He wants you individually to make a difference, and he wants us as a church to make a difference. And this may surprise you, but God actually wants this church to grow more than even we want it to grow. Why? Because he loves people. And I've been trying to study and figure out why is God blessing our church? I know churches all over America that are not seeing the growth that we've seen. I mean, just a few years ago, one service and then two services and then three services. Now there's five weekend services that we have as a church. And I don't think God has done. I, I think God wants more because I think there's more people in this community that need a life-giving relationship with him. And so I've been trying to figure out what is it about our church? There's other churches that are praying to experience the momentum that we've been experiencing. So what I want to do today is I want to give you what I've discovered for three reasons. Number one, to simply let you know what we're doing as a church. Number two, to teach it to you so that we can continue to do it. I mean, there's some things we're doing right around here, and we want to we continue to do those things. And then finally, I want to give it to you in such a way that you can apply it to any area of your life. I'm convinced that if you apply the principles that God has given us as a church to your marriage, to your family, to your business, to your career, you'll see the type of momentum that we're experiencing in a church family. And so what I'm going to call today is principles that produce momentum, principles that if you apply them to areas of your life, you're going to see momentum. And here's what you need to know. There are common principles in the Bible, common principles that when you follow certain guidelines, when you follow certain principles, there's, there's blessings and there's results that are attached to it. Let, let me give you just one example so you can kind of get a picture of this truth. Because I really believe God is blessing us because we are following certain guidelines. Here, here, here's one, for example, in Ephesians. Honor your father and your mother. There's a principle. There's a guideline that God has given us. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. There's a result. There is a blessing. There is a promise attached to principles and guidelines that God gives us that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. I like some of that. I don't know about you, but I, I, I like the idea of long life and I like it better if it goes well. In fact, if it doesn't go well, I don't want it to be that long, to be very honest. <laughs> but I like that. I mean, I want some of that. Well, there's a, there's a principle there. So if you follow certain principles, there's going to be a blessing attached. And I think that's true for churches. I think that's true for our family. I think it's true for marriages. I think it's true for every aspect of life. And so again, the reason we need to understand this 
is because I'm believing for the next 10 years of our church. I think the next 10 years of our church is going to be one of the greatest seasons we're ever going to experience as a family, as a community. And so I want to understand this a little deeper so that we can go a little deeper into what got us to this point. So we're going to look at the book of Numbers today. We're going to study out of the book of Numbers today. And it's funny to me because I hear a lot of, they're typically hyper-spiritual or super spiritual people who, who like to say things, well, well, God's not into numbers. Well, he actually wrote a whole book called Numbers, so he kind of is into numbers. <laughs> and the reason God is into numbers is because God is into people. People matter to God. And I've heard people criticize me. I've heard people criticize our church. They say, well, you, you're just all about the numbers. Yes, we're guilty. You got it right. We are all about the numbers. Why? Because numbers represent people and people matter to God. Numbers matter. I don't have between one and four children. I have two children. <laughs> like that number matters to me. I don't know about you, but it matters to me. Like I want to know how many kids I have. I'm not just guessing because they matter. They matter. Now we don't we don't, we don't look at numbers for our own glory. We know that. It's not about us. It, it, it's not about us getting any glory at all. We simply want to reach people that matter to God. So let me show you some principles that produce momentum. It comes out of the story of the children of Israel. After they come out of Egypt, they go through the Red Sea, dramatic miracle. They're on a journey that should have taken them nine days, nine days to cross the wilderness into Israel, the promised land. But instead, because of their complaining, because of some bad choices, they're now going to spend the next 40 years of their life wandering in circles around the wilderness. And the thing is, they want to worship. They want to have church, but they don't have a, a stationary place. They're mobile, and so they've got to come up with a way to do portable church. This church was portable for years. It went from hotels to libraries to uh, storefronts before they settled on this piece of land. That's what's taking place. They're wandering around for 40 years, and they've got to figure out a way to do portable church. And so God, God gave them the blueprint for the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent that they could build, they could worship. And then when God would move, again, God would represent the smoke, the pillar of smoke by day and the pillar of fire by night. And when that pillar would begin to move, they would have to pack up camp and they would take off and they would follow the cloud to wherever God would stop. And then they would set up everything again. And in the center of this, this tent, this tabernacle, was the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark? That was the Ark at the center of this. So they needed a plan for how to move it. In the plan, there's some incredible principles that I believe apply to our church, our life, our business, many areas. It says in Numbers chapter 3, there were, these were the names of the sons of Levi. Levi was one of the 12 brothers of Jacob. It was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Levi was the tribe that became the priesthood. They were in charge of worship, kind of the pastoring of the rest of the tribes. And his sons were Gershon, Kohath, and Merai. Now, when we see how the tabernacle was broken apart, we see in these three sons, their families had different responsibilities. In verse 36, the Merarites, the Merai's clan, they were appointed to take care of the frames of the tabernacle, its crossbars, posts, bases, all its equipment, and everything related to their use, as well as the posts of the surrounding courtyard with their bases, tent pegs, and ropes. In other words, they were responsible for the structure, the post, the beam. In essence, this part of the tabernacle that you couldn't see with the physical eye because it would be covered up. Then we have the next one, the Gershonites. In verse 25, they were responsible for the care of the tabernacle and the tent, its coverings, the curtain at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. This was the part that you could see with your eye, the, the skin of the tabernacle, the tent, the fabric. And then finally, in verse 30, we have the Kohathite clan, and they were responsible for the care of the ark, the ark of the covenant, the table of showbread, the lampstand, the altars, the articles of the sanctuary used in ministering, the curtain, and everything related to their use. In other words, they were responsible for the worship elements, the spiritual part of it. So you have Morai, who is responsible for the beams, the posts, the structure. You have Gershon, his family, responsible for the, the curtain, the tent, the fabric, the, the system of the whole thing. 
And then you have Kohath, who's responsible for the ark and all the articles of worship, the spiritual. God was setting an order here so that the whole thing would work. And I believe the reason why we have seen momentum as a church is because we have set some things in order in our house. Principles from thousands of years ago that still apply to us today. And I believe that if you will set some things in order in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your business, you are going to see some momentum, principles that will produce momentum. So let me show you these three things and kind of how we're doing it as a church and and let God lead you to applying it to your situation. First off is we see structural momentum. Structural momentum. This is the stuff that you can't see, but it holds it all together. It's the frame, the beams, the posts, the structure. If you ever seen somebody build a house, they spent a lot of time on the foundation of the home. And then they build the frame of the home. And then in just a few weeks after the frame goes up, they put the skin, the drywall, the, the, the siding on the home. And then all of a sudden, you never see the foundation again. You never see the frame again. It becomes invisible, but it's there holding it all together. You see, we as a church have things that you don't see that that, that are kind of invisible to the eye, but are written into who we are. In fact, some of them we've actually written into our bylaws and into our government to keep our foundation firm. Truth is, there are many people here that God could be using in greater ways. You could be experiencing much more momentum in your life if you had the foundation right, if you had the frame, the structure of your life right. So here's what we've done as a church to kind of build this structure. First is we've got clear vision and values. Clear vision. I talk to a lot of pastors around America, and they don't have a clear vision. They don't know where they're going. They can't articulate the roadmap. I ask the question, if somebody gave you two years of their life, what is the roadmap for their spiritual journey? And they can't articulate. Well, we just want them to, to grow closer to God but they really can't articulate the roadmap. I think one of the things that, that God has done well through our church is we have a clear roadmap. We know where we're trying to bring people. If, if you wanna be a part of our church family, we know what the journey looks like. And it's, and it's the vision of our church, which is simply this, we wanna help people know God. If you don't know God, we want you to know God. We want you to have a relationship with them. And then when you know God, we want you to help settle the yesterdays in your life to find freedom. We all have a little bit of baggage. We all have a little bit of junk from our childhood that, that we need to let go of. And then when we find freedom, we got to discover our purpose. What did God create us and put us on planet Earth to do and accomplish? And then when we've discovered what God made us for, we want to empower people to make a difference with their life to go, go do something significant for God. And in fact, we know the greatest way to pastor you is to help you get to this fourth step because the most fulfilling life you will ever live is the life of making a difference. Psychologists call it transcendence, the, the, the greatest need of a human being, to live a life beyond themselves. And this is the vision of who we are. We simply want to help people know God and those that know God find freedom, and those that have found freedom discover their purpose, and those that have discovered purpose to make a difference. We have values as a church, values that we talk a lot about as leaders, our staff. We actually reward our staff based on values, and it's simply this, four of them, love God. It's all going to be about God. We do it because we love God. Like God is the priority. This isn't a job. This isn't a career. We love God. And second, we love people. And this is what Jesus considers the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. So we're going to love. It's all about people. Our third value is excellence. We're going to do things the best of our ability. Like we want things to be the very best that they can be. We're not going to settle for a it's good enough culture. We want to give God our absolute best in every area, in every way. And then lastly, we want to have a lot of fun on the journey. Like, like we want to have fun doing it. And let me just say it right now. If you're not a part of the dream team currently, you need to get on the dream team before July because our dream team party is coming up and it is the most fun we have all year. I mean, it is an exclusive party for dream team, but I'm telling you, it, it'll be the party of all parties. We, every year, 
We have the time of our life at the dream team party because we want to have fun doing this. So we got clear vision, clear values. Do you have clear vision for your marriage, clear values for your family, for your business? Second thing that we do is we have scriptural church government. See, the problem with a lot of churches is they either have too much accountability and no freedom and it chokes the life out of the leaders or they have all freedom and no accountability and the leaders get the church in trouble. What you need to have is you need to have a balance of freedom and accountability where you've got great accountability, people watching over you that care for you, that love you, that, that ask you tough questions to keep things in line. How many of you enjoyed Pastor Rick Bezet last week? Wasn't he awesome? I mean, that, that was some of the most fun we've had in church. I mean, but at the end of the day, the message was so heartfelt. And if you missed it, watch it online because it was powerful. Well, one of the things you didn't know is one of the reasons he was here is we were talking to him about being one of our overseers as a church to have, have him kind of watch out for us. And I'm glad to announce that he accepted and he is now one of our five overseers as a church family. Listen, we want people like that speaking into us. We want people like that watching out. I want guys like that who are calling me and asking me the tough questions like, are you loving your wife? Because I just think that you would appreciate having a pastor that loved his wife. I just think that would be a good thing for you. And we need overseers. We need people that keep us accountable. And if you're not seeing momentum in your life, it could be that who's keeping you accountable? Who are you submitted to in life? Who's speaking into your life? And then finally, we have solid financial principles here. We spend money wisely, well, we do what we're going to say we're going to do. And we have three basic guidelines when it comes to our finances. First is integrity. Everything we're going to do, we're going to do it with integrity. We're going to do exactly what we say we're going to do. This is one of the reasons why, as a church, we don't have to do this. Nobody requires us to do it. In fact, I'm the one that requires us to do it every single year. We're going to do a full, independent audit on our church finances. And not only are we going to do an independent audit of our church finances, but when it's finished, we're going to put it right on our website for anybody. You don't have to be a member, anybody to go to our website and look at. Why? Because we're going to operate with integrity. We're going to operate with transparency. We, we have nothing to hide. So you can go right now to our website and look at the 2016 audit and see how we handle finances. Now, you don't need to email me this week and correct me because I, because I, 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 I know, when it comes to tithing, I know that we don't tithe because we like the church or feel good about the church. I know as a Christian, as a believer, according to the Bible, we tithe out of obedience. So you don't need to correct me. But let me just say, isn't it good to feel safe about where you tithe? Isn't it good to feel secure? Like, I, I know that that's not why we do it because of obedience. We do it because God commands us to do it. We don't, we don't do it for any other reason. But I just think as a tither, it's good to know that I can feel secure about where I tithe. I know how it's being used. I know it's going to be used to maximize and make a difference. Integrity. Second area is stewardship. We're going to be good stewards of everything God has entrusted us with. Meaning we're going to spend less money than what comes in because we want to live with margin. In fact, we actually wrote that into our government that every single year we will budget our expense budget on 90% of the previous year income. So we're always creating margin. Why? So we never have to live under pressure. We, I, I never have the pressure as a pastor where I feel like I've got to manipulate people for money. I'm not going to be a fundraiser. That's not my passion. I want to teach the Bible. I don't want to stand up here and raise money. And so we budget in a way where we're never under pressure. We all, in fact, we only spend about 70% of our income to operate this place on an average basis. And that allows us to give, that allows us to grow, that allows us to advance where we don't have to do fundraisers or campaigns. In fact, we're, we're gearing up right now to build a brand new children and youth facility, state of the art. I talked about it earlier this year. I know I always make the team nervous when I do it because it's, it's very, uh, you know, it, it, these are very preliminary rough draft sketches, but how many wanna see a couple of the sketches we're working with with the architect right now? 
Now, these are rough draft sketches. There's going to be a lot of changes, but we're in the process of meeting with the city, meeting with the architects. We've got a, a state-of-the-art children's building going in right outside near the playground, beautiful, multi-level structure. It's going to be incredible to see what God is going to do. And over half of the money we need to do it, we, we have through our budgeting principles. And since we began talking about it, we haven't even done a fundraiser. We're not even doing a campaign. But since we just shared the vision, we've already had people give up to $300,000 to advance this. I mean, just God, God's just putting it on people's heart to, to say, you know what, Let, let's just get this done as quick as we can get it done. And let's go for it and let's do it. And that's one of our commitments to you. We're going to move at the speed of your generosity. We're not, we're not going to outpace your giving. We're not going to go obligate you to something that you didn't sign up to pay for and then come back and have to pressure you to pay for something you never signed up for. We're just going to move at the speed of your generosity, and that's what God is allowing us to do. And then finally, generosity. We're going to be generous people. We're, we, we give over 10% of our income away to high-impact ministries around the world. Here's the thing. You can be very tight with your budget and stingy, God's not going to bless you. Or you can be very generous and not tight, not a good steward, and God's not going to bless you either. See, the reason we are tight financially, the reason we are good stewards is so that we can make a difference, so that we can be generous, so that we can make an impact. That's the structure, what you don't see. Then we have systematic momentum as a church. That's what we actually do. That's the program. That's the system. That's, that's kind of the practical how we do what we do. And what we've done is we've directly connected our system to our vision. We thought if God's plan for all of mankind is that they know him, that they deal with their yesterday, that they figure out why they're on planet Earth, and then they live their life making a difference, why don't we just build a system that accomplishes that? Well, why come up with something else? And that's why we don't do a whole lot as a church. We, we really just focus on a few main things. And so here's how we do it. The know God component of our vision, we do that through our weekend services. That, that's what we do every weekend around here is we, we allow, we, we create an environment where people who are brand new to church and brand new to Christianity can come and they can feel comfortable and they can be anonymous and they can check us out. And when they're ready to make a decision for Jesus, they can make a decision for Jesus. But you got to know the vision of that. Because for those of you that have been around for a while, I know you're tired of me saying, hey, here's the red worship guide. You're like, why does he say the same thing every single week? Because I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the person who's been here for the very first time. And the truth is, every weekend, there's someone that's here for the very first time. And we want to make them feel at home. We want to make them feel welcome. And, and it's working. Since January 1st alone, we've had over 500 people in our weekend services raise their hand and make decisions for Jesus Christ. This is working. We've had over 75 of those people water baptized. Second, second part of the vision is we pastor people through small groups. That, that's how we help people deal with their yesterdays. The truth is God will forgive you of your sins, but it's not God's job to keep you from doing it again. If you really want to become the person God created you to be, you're going to need community to do it. You're going to need people to help you to do it. We, we are changed through our relationships. Here, here's the thing. I have a lot of people who like, Pastor, can you counsel me? Pastor, can you counsel me? Can, can, we, can I set up for some counseling? I've done this for 20 years now. Can I be very honest with you? I get very little results through counseling. Very little. And it's not just because I'm a bad counselor. The truth is, one-on-one <laughs> -on -one counseling does not make a whole lot of progress in your life. The truth is, like, I could sit down and meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, and we could talk about whatever you want to talk about, and, and you're going you're gonna to grow about this much, to be very, very honest. But if I can get you to commit to a community of people, if I can get you to commit to a small group as a man to get around some healthy men in our church and as a woman to get around some healthy women in our church, you're going to grow like that. You're going to grow. Why? Because you have accountability. You have people that are going to follow up with you. You have people that are going to encourage you to walk it out. I can sit and talk to you, and I'll pray for you, and, and we'll ask God to forgive you. But again, it's in community with people that you're really going to grow and that you're really going to change. 
Next up is we want to help you discover your purpose. We do that through the growth track. Four classes that we ask every single person who attends our church to take these four classes one time, one time. And the whole purpose of it is to figure out why God created you. They say 87% of Christians in America, when asked the question, what are you here for? What is your life purpose? They have no answer. They don't know why God created them. The truth is, for, for many people here today, you don't even know what your spiritual gifts are. God hardwired you. Every one of you has six or seven spiritual gifts in your life that God put into your DNA. Peter says, use those gifts to serve one another. How can you do that if you don't even know what your gifts are? So what we've done is we, we've created four classes to help you figure that out. Four classes to assess your spiritual gifts, your design, how God wired you to figure out why God made you to be a catalyst to discovering your purpose. And then finally, when you do that, we want to get you to the most rewarding part of the vision, which is make a difference. And we do that through the dream team. We do that, we do that through making a difference every single week. And one of the things I love to tell our dream team is what else did you do this week that's going to be around 10 million years from now? I mean, think about it. How many things did you do this week that's really going to last and really going to matter 10 million years from today? The truth is what we're doing right now will. Because the people who are going to respond to Jesus through this service and through this weekend and the people who served on the dream team, that's going to matter 10 million years from now. That's going to make a difference 10 million years. So I think we just need to stop for a moment and let's honor our dream team that makes this happen every single week. Come on, let's, let's give our dream team a hand right now. We have people who work so hard every week and they show up early, they set up, they're in the parking lot. Thank God for the people down at Coastline Kids. I mean, that dream team is awesome. I tell you, I love dropping my nine-year-old son off down there because the truth is, he doesn't like my preaching. I don't think any nine-year-old likes my preaching. I mean, they, they just, you know, it, it, nine and younger, they don't get it. I'm glad that they have their own church experience where they can get the gospel in a way that they can understand it and they can hear and they can learn. And we got people who are trained in background checks and security where they've got a safe environment to have church. That's the power of the dream team. What are your family systems? See, the problem with North County right now is we have systems that are designed to lead you into divorce. That's what's happening right now in our community. People have family systems that are so out of control, that are so out of balance, people running so many directions. We have a system that many of us worship called busyness, and it's killing families. You've got to decide what are you going to do and what are you not going to do? What is the system for your marriage? What is the system for your family? What is the system for your business and your career? We want structure. We want to make sure we know who we are, what our values are, what we believe. We want the right systems. We want to know where we're going and how we're going to get there and how to do it. And then finally, and most importantly, we need spiritual momentum. You can do everything else, but without God, we're just an empty tent. We're just a bunch of posts and a bunch of fabric and nothing happened. We need the presence of God. Desperately need the presence of God in this place. And yes, it is true. There are churches who pray, 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 and they don't have any structure and they don't have any systems and they're not going there. We need all three. We need, we need to have a foundation. We need to know what we do, and we need God in the middle. If we, without God, we're in trouble. I'm not gifted enough to do this job. Like, I am not talented enough. We, we as leaders know that we have to depend on him. And for some of you that aren't seeing momentum right now, it's because you've got to get God right back in the middle. In the middle of your marriage, in the middle of your business, in the middle of your career, in the middle of your family, you got to bring God back. So how do we do that? Well, let me give you three principles that we as a church are very, very passionate about. First is we focus on the Word of God. Let me just say, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I passionately believe that we need to read the Bible every day. Every day. Every day. 
I, I, I pray to God that I'm not the only spiritual food you get every week. I, I pray that you are learning how to feed yourself, that you are getting into the word of God every single day. If you only ate one meal a week, you're going to be malnourished. And unfortunately, we've got a lot of believers who are spiritually malnourished because they are not in the word. And the thing is, this book, Hebrews says it clearly, it is alive and it is powerful. This is just not another book with pages filled with ink. This book is living, it's breathing, it breathes life into you, it's powerful, it will change you. If you don't have a Bible, we love to give them, we give away hundreds of Bibles for free every year. Go to our info center, pick up one today. We would love to give you a Bible. If you want to figure out how to read it, we've got reading plans. My personal favorite is the one-year Bible. One-year Bible takes about 15 minutes a day, and you will read through the entire Bible in a year. I'm telling you, we need to be people of the Word. We need to be in God's Word every day, every day, every day. Read this book. Second is we focus on worship. Worship is powerful. Worship is when we give God the glory due his name. Here's what's funny to me. Do you realize that the beginning of church, when we do the music, that's worship. That, that's, that's when we worship God. Do you realize that's the only part of the service where we give to God? The rest of the service God gives to you, right? Right? God uses me as your pastor to, to bring a message that feeds you, that encourages you, that helps you. That's God giving you. The music part, the worship part, is the whole part of the service where we give to God. And isn't it interesting that that's the part of the service that many of us are late to? Like we're robbing God of what is due his name, the glory due his name. Now, if you're visiting our church, worship is there for your enjoyment. But if you've been a believer for any more than two weeks, <laughs> the music is not for your enjoyment. The music is to lead you to worship God. And, and, and this may sound a little funny to you, but I've done this for a long time now. This is, I, I've been in full-time ministry for over 20 years. And let me tell you a truth that I've seen over and over and over. When I, and, and this is predominantly for men, but it also applies to women. When I see a man for the first time go like this in the middle of worship, for the first time, they're about to skyrocket spiritually. They're about to grow. Because I don't know what it is. For, for men, we have such a hard time lifting up our hands during worship. And that is directly connected to your spiritual maturity and your spiritual growth. Mark my words. I've done this a long time. Every time I see this happen for the very first time, you look at the next three months of their spiritual journey, and you're going to see growth and maturity like you've never seen in somebody before. Because this is a sign of surrender. When, when, when a man can surrender fully to God, God's like, I can use that. We can do something. And some of you haven't figured out, why, why, why are you not growing the way you want to grow? Why are you not maturing the... I'm telling you, it's direct. You may laugh and think that, you know, I'm, no, I'm not. I'm telling you, it's directly connected. It's directly connected. And I don't know what it is about Christian men. Like, you don't see this in the Muslim world. Muslims will worship, you know, anywhere. Like, they'll just, like, get down in the middle of the street and start bowing. Like, they are unashamed, but they're so... And, and the funny thing is, we'll do this at an NFL game, won't we? But it comes to the church, it's like, it's so hard to get those hands up. But I'm telling you, when that happens, you're going to see growth in your journey like you've never seen before. Mark my words. Try it. Experiment. Just do it for three months. And if I'm lying, I'm lying. But I'm telling you. So I love what the Bible says about worship. I'll thank you in front of the great assembly. Like, I'm not going to be ashamed of you in front of people. I'll praise you before all of the people. I'll praise you, O Lord, with all of my heart. And then here's my favorite in Timothy. In every place of worship, this is a place of worship, I want men, <laughs> say that with me, men, Amen. to pray with holy hands lifted high to God. Amen. I'm telling you, there's something powerful when men lift their hands to God. There's something powerful that takes place when this happens. And then finally, we're going to focus on prayer. 
focus on prayer. We put a lot of energy in prayer. Prayer is actually what's building our church. We don't do marketing. We don't send out postcards to our community. We don't do any type of advertising, but we put a lot of energy in a prayer. Every year, we begin January with 21 days of prayer and fasting, where we're seeking God Monday to Friday, 6.30 in the morning. August, coming up in just a couple months, we're going to do another 21 days of prayer in August to, to end the summer before we move into the school season. We're going to seek God. We're going to pray. Every Saturday, every Saturday, we meet in this room at 9 a.m. and we pray for you. If you're struggling in your prayer life, you're trying to figure out, come this Saturday at 9 a.m. Join us this Saturday at 9 a.m. Come. We'll help you with your prayer life. We'll help you build it. Every time I stand up here and preach, there's people behind this wall praying for me and praying for you. I don't ever want to preach up here if I know people don't have my back. See, I can preach with so much boldness and confidence because I know there's people right now praying for me. Right now behind this wall praying for me. Maybe you want to be a part of the prayer dream team. We're building this place through prayer. What's really interesting about this point, if you, if you continue studying number seven, I don't have time to go through all the scripture, but I put it in your notes. The people, they came to Moses and they brought oxen in carts. Why? Because it was heavy to move that tower. I mean, imagine moving these posts, these beams. These are huge beams. And, and all of the, the tent and the fabric, this is heavy stuff. And so they brought oxen in cart as an offering to all of these clans to help them. When God began to move, they needed to pack up camp. They needed to set up, you know, tear down the tabernacle, put it on the carts and move out. But it's interesting what it says at the end. Look at this. So the Gershonites and the Merorites were both given oxen and cart to move, to move the, pom, the, the beast, the beams, all the frames, the, the curtain, the tent, the fabric. But for some reason, Moses didn't give any of it to the Kohathites. It's interesting, isn't it? He didn't give one oxen, one cart to the Kohathites, to the ones that were in charge of the spiritual. They were in charge of the ark, the lamp, the table, and here's why. Because they were to carry on their shoulders the holy things for which they were responsible. See, that tells us we don't delegate the spiritual. That's why I come to prayer every Saturday. As the, I don't delegate it to somebody else. I'm here. I'm praying. Now, what does that mean for you? Well, for a lot of men, that means you don't, you don't allow your wife to outpray you in your home. I know a lot of men who, well, my wife, she likes to study the Bible. My wife, she likes to pray. I'm just not in it. No, 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 no. We carry those things on our own shoulders. We don't delegate that to our wife. We don't delegate that to our husband. We carry the spiritual on our shoulders. That means, men, you need to be the prayer leader in your home. You need to be studying the Bible. You need to be a man of worship. And women, the same is true for you. We don't delegate that to somebody else in our family. We don't delegate that to our pastor. I'll pray for you, but I'm going to pray that I'm not the only one praying for you, that you're praying for you too. Like, I'll join and I'll agree with you in prayer, but don't expect me to do the heavy lifting for you. We carry the things of the spiritual on our shoulders. We don't delegate that out to somebody else. And this is why God's blessing our church. We have, we have structure here. We've got clear systems. We know what we do. We know what we don't do. And we put a lot of energy in getting God to be in the middle of this thing. To make it absolutely clear that we're not doing it without him. Like God is the center of this thing. And we are dependent it on him and rarely do I see all three of these in place sometimes you see churches with great structure but no presence of God and sometimes you see churches with all presence of God and no structure and nothing happened we need all three you need all three in your marriage you need all three in your business you need all three in your home you need these principles to apply would you close your eyes for just a moment before we leave today, let me ask you, is your relationship with God where it needs to be right now?
And I'm not talking about you had a bad week. Let me describe it like this. For some of you, you've had a friendship and you've just grown apart. You've grown apart and you're not as close to that friend, that person as you used to be because you've grown apart. For some of you, that describes your relationship with God. You've just grown apart. Over time, you've grown apart. You stop spending time. For some of you today, you've never begun a relationship with God. This could be your very first time at church. So what I'd like to do before we leave is I'd like to lead both groups in a simple prayer of either reconnecting with God or beginning a relationship with God. And I'm not going to ask you to stand up. You don't have to walk anywhere. You don't even have to pray this out loud. This is actually a prayer from your heart to God. And God will respond to your heart today. And I believe that if you pray from your heart, that you'll, you'll take the next steps to build that relationship. So if you're here today and you need to say a prayer because you've grown apart from God or you've never had a relationship with God, I'd like to lead you to a point of connecting with Him. So with every eye closed, out of respect, and just so that I know who's praying with me, if you'd like to pray this very simple prayer with me, would you very quickly just raise your hand and then put it right back down? Just lift up your hand, put it right back down. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate those hands, thank you. In your heart, pray this. Say, Jesus, today I give you total control of my life. Jesus, forgive me for the sin that separated me from you. And finally, Jesus, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you will never hold my past against me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, what you just did is you opened the door to have an incredible relationship with God. You cleared the road. You cleared the path. There is now, understand this, there is nothing blocking you and God right now. You have a clear access, clear path. Nothing is separating you. Now, you've got to decide to develop that relationship, and we'd love to help you with it. We'd love to give you some next steps in developing that relationship and growing that relationship. Just like if you met somebody and, and you guys hit it off incredibly well, and you just had this amazing introduction, this amazing connection, then you never saw the person again? I mean, no, you, you wouldn't maintain that relationship. It's the same with God. You had this incredible connection. Now it's time to learn how to walk it out. And we'd love to help you with that. If you'd let me know today that you prayed with us, you can do it on your connection card. There's two boxes. I'm committing my life to Christ. I'm renewing my commitment to Christ. If you simply let us know what decision you made today, We'll send you an email this week, and that's it. Unless you specifically ask for more, all you'll get is an email, and the email just outlines next steps in your relationship with God, and we'll help you with it. Would you stand with me before we close? Father, in the name of Jesus, God, help us as a church understand how you've gotten us to this point. The structure, the systems, the spiritual... And God, let us go deeper in those areas because we know that you have more for our future as a church family. And God, I pray that you would give wisdom, that you would speak clearly to everyone here how to apply these three principles in their family, in their marriage, in their parenting, in their business, in their career that will give them the momentum that they desire and seek. Momentum that will enable them to do more for you Jesus' name.